Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today's panel on data governance and innovation for BFSI, hosted by Ethom Venture Partners and Velotix. This is Pankaj Gupta from Ethom Venture Partners. Ethom is a deep tech revenue accelerator based in Singapore. We are fortunate enough to have 70 plus startups in our portfolio and to receive support from the likes of Enterprise Singapore, Singapore Hong Kong, Microsoft, AWS, Oracle, Twilio, Rackspace, and many more. Velotix is one of the portfolio startups of Ethom, which is solving data governance challenges for the BFSI sector. And they are based in Israel, but they have customer base in Europe, Israel, and now looking at Asia Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific as well. Velotix and Ethom are really excited to host this panel since it gives us a fantastic opportunity to connect with the data leaders, learn from their insights, and build a fabulous community of subject matter experts. During the panel, Adi, CEO of Velotix, will ask some truly intriguing questions to our esteemed panelists. And I would also request the audience to share their comments and insights in the chat section. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat section so that we can take them uh, when there is the right, the right time. Hope you enjoy today's insight, uh, insightful discussion and connect with Velotix, Ethom, and panelists after the event for exploring collaboration opportunities. Now I will pass it on to Adi so that he can introduce himself, Velotex, and then we can move on to the introduction of our esteemed and diverse panelists. Again, thanks everybody for joining. Adi, please take the stage. Thank you very much, Pankaj, uh, and uh, hello everybody. So my name is Dr. Adi Hod, I'm specialized in the data science, uh, algorithms and operation research. In the last year, a little bit over a year ago, founded the co-founded Velotix and leading the company. Velotix developed an innovative solution, technology, and approach to enable that enable a data orchestration and the data governance systems. We built our solution together with Deutsche Bank for about a little bit over twelve months. Two uh, seed investment rounds in the last 12 months and about to launch the product to the market uh, during June. Um, I would like to uh, give the uh, other panelists to present themselves. So please, uh, Mr. Uh, Van Kat. Hi, hi, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Bala Van Kat. Uh, uh, head of data analytics and digital initiatives from uh, Citibank uh, International Personal Banking Division. Um, and, uh, and this is one of the uh, I'm passionate about data. This is one of the, uh, the topics that we, we constantly discuss. So I'm, I'm very happy that uh, we are giving the importance that it deserves. And uh, thanks for Velotix to, to bring this discussion and uh, looking forward. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Venkat. And uh, uh, Mr. Rajan, please. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Adi. Thank you, Pankaj, for hosting. So, yeah, I, I head data and analytics for Mashrek Bank in the Middle East. Uh, before this, I was in Standard Chartered Bank for 10 years in Singapore, where I was building the data and analytics framework, as well as digital transformation for the wholesale bank. So about 22 years in the banking and finance sector. And uh, in today in Mashrek, we're dealing with multiple challenges related to data in the region, as well as uh, how, how to deal with the regulations and the governance. So this is an important topic for us and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Singh. Thank you, uh, Adi. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Rishi and uh, I'm the head of uh, Group Enterprise Data Governance and Data Quality uh, at UOB Bank in Singapore. So as, as background, my, uh, my career, I started off as a consultant working for PwC for over a decade in uh, data and information management. Uh, thereafter, I had a stint with uh, GIC, which is Singapore's Sovereign Wealth Fund. I was leading the data governance and strategy unit there. And, and for the last three years, I'm with uh, UOB Bank and uh, you know, involved in enterprise data government strategy as well as operationalization across the bank and the group. So this is a subject which I'm, I'm very passionate about, data governance. And uh, you know, uh, even at UOB, I do cover data governance policy making and you know, coming up with the bank-wide bank -wide guidelines and advisories and uh, looking at proactive data quality management and uh, data protection as well. So looking forward to an exciting discussion at the panel today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Mr. Gupta. 
Hi everyone, I'm Samir Gupta. I'm the erstwhile head of uh, data management and digital banking for DBS Consumer Bank in Singapore. And uh, over the last five years, I had been driving uh, the data-driven agenda for DBS, uh, uh, pushing through the data monetization strategy, uh, building uh, resilient infrastructure, governance capabilities, uh, building the capabilities for experimentation at scale to drive customer obsession. I come from a very non-traditional data background before uh, taking over this role, which was five years back. Uh, I was a CFO for the same business. So I am uh, come from the uh, view from both the data function as a well line function. So I bring two different perspectives. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about data governance. Uh, so what, what what is data governance? Uh, it's a process. It's a process of uh, managing availability, usability, integrity, and security of data in your enterprise system. It's about controlling the data and enable enterprises to use data in order to drive the organization. In everything, everything you can see in the data, if you analyze your data, if you watch your data, if you um, look, you will see. We say that um, if you have a fire in your organization, you can see the smoke in the data. Uh, so, as, as I said, here, here in Velotix, we build a, a, a proprietary technology uh, that is basically a new approach, a new technology to enable accessibility and sharing data. Uh, and uh, we about to launch it in June to the market. Uh, and using this technology, we enable data orchestration and data governance uh, in a way that we can share and expose data uh, to anyone in the organization or outside the organization, but still keep the organization rules and outside regulations comply with the data. Uh, and the question that I would like to ask the panel here is uh, what are the most painful challenges in data governance and analytics that uh, you are more so leaders are most concerned about nowadays. Uh, I'll hand the question to Mr. Venkat first, please. Yeah, sure, I, I think this is, um, uh, this is probably close to everybody's heart here. Uh, there's a number of uh, challenges that we have, uh, right? And some of these are not new. Some of these challenges have been there for some time. One is, uh, of course, uh, how do you ensure your quality of the data? So I think this is with increasing number of uh, data points coming across, especially now uh, most organizations are trying to become digitally driven. You, know, you, you find uh, the plethora of data. So now how do you ensure that at the same time you maintain the control, the quality and the governance of it? So I think increasing data, one challenge. And second one is we most more and more customers are expecting you to, to do that kind of personalization. So when you have, uh, you need to find out a way to balance this personalization and data governance. So data privacy is, is becoming more and more of a, of a key topic. Uh, and we need to revolve around the data governance. So I think this is uh, to ensure that you get that balance of personalization and at the same time data governance. And the third challenge I would, uh, I would, um, I would highlight, which is an age old problem is is the ownership of it? Where does the ownership lie? Is this a is this a technical problem or is it a business problem? The ownership needs to be very important to ensure that data governance is not necessarily a data technical issue, but it's a business owned responsibility to drive it. I think these are for me. Uh, I would highlight there are many challenges, but I highlight these three challenges to start with, from my opinion. Mr. Singh, please. Thank you, thank you, Adi. Uh, I think uh, uh, just now, you know, my fellow panelist, he has covered very, very interestingly uh, three unique challenges which we also face, you know, uh, in, in the data governance world. I would like to add uh, a couple of more points. Um, there, there's this one challenge we, we constantly grapple with is around, uh, you know, the differing and the evolving legal and regulatory landscape across the region. And, and because of that, you know, operating in a regional environment uh, where typically our data sources come from multiple jurisdictions, uh, all these data specific regulations tend to be sometimes quite different and non-standardized. And because of which 
you know, it's, it's difficult to centralize some of the architectures and, you know, centralize some of these data repositories. And, and sometimes, you know, these regulations tend to be very stringent. And, and uh, nowadays there's a growing trend of data localization in many countries as well. And that's, that's causing, uh, you know, a bit of a headache for us from a, from an overall architecture and governance standpoint. So I guess, I guess, you know, in terms of achieving long-term data management efficiency and, you know, scaling our operations and, and, and making it more regional and also facilitating cross, uh, cross territory, cross business analytics and monetization. I think this is one of the, one of the challenges we, we grapple with. The second point I would like to maybe touch upon, right, is, um, is more around the accurate measurement of the of the ROI. You know, typically in terms of uh, I would say application of data science and AI techniques, I would say that this is still something which is uh, is feasible because you know we are able to sort of uh, apply certain assumptions and methods to determine what should be the ROI. But when it comes down to let's say data management and data governance uh, programs, I think there precisely measuring the ROI tends to be a challenge. And, and that's primarily due to the, the complexity of, you know, the underlying, uh, underlying business processes, the data management and technical operations, uh, you know, when data is moving from, you know, your, your source originating systems down to your downstream data lakes and your warehouses, it's very difficult to sometimes track uh, the ROI in, in that process. So that's another challenge that we, we do grapple with. Excellent, thank you so much. So. Uh, I, I can share that we in Velotix, uh, analyzing the market, we found that uh, one of the main challenges with data governments is that recently it comprised more and more business processes uh, and application in the organization. And therefore, we develop as part of our uh, solution a, a sophisticated workflow tool that enable a definition of any business process in the organization that require orchestration or governance of data. Uh, the business process uh, uh, relate or, or link to data owner, data steward, and uh, we can define multiple uh, uh, data or business processes, which we also consider as part of our best practices. And the system follow the business process and log and capture the, the information and transaction of the data in a way that not only that the system can, the system can enforce a certain policy, Policy, which I'll talk about it later, it also captures the flow of the data, the approval process, and, and, can, and can use it as, as best practices and as, a, a, as an excellent tool for auditing and control in a later stage as required mainly by a, a large enterprises which are regularly audited by, a, by a, a governments and auditing systems. A, so we, with that tool, we can see working already with the system in Deutsche Bank and several other POCs, that anyone in the organization or outside the organization experience data is something that is very easy to find, locate, and, and ready to use. Uh, the question that we'd like to address here uh, is what are the innovations in data governance and analytics that you are experiencing in your organization or, or in in, in anywhere else that you can explore, uh, anything that you are excited about or anything that you foresee as the main, uh, the main innovations that, that the world will experience uh, in, in the next one or two years. Uh, I will address the question to uh, Mr. Ray Rajan first, please. Thank you, thank you. I think uh, this is an exciting time to be in uh, the data analytics space. Uh, We've, we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of buzz in the space though I think we've, we've seen a lot of uh, we've seen a lot of activity which uh, which promised with, with a lot of promise to come so I think one of the major innovations that I find today is the application of AIML to data governance so you know uh, it, it is it is uh, uh, the ability to parse large amounts of data to be able to recognize bad data, uh, using AIML, I think, is a big boost. It, it's a natural application because any uh, data science is actually 70 to 80 percent data wrangling and data engineering. So, this is something that you know many times we forget that if we don't uh, focus on the data engineering and data governance, you actually struggle with the data science part. So, so I think that is a positive feedback loop where we can use models to improve our data governance. 
The second thing I think uh, in terms of uh, tooling is you know the uh, the latest uh, the latest tools that are there out in the market, the low code, no code tools, and the the advent of cloud uh, includes the tools that are natively available on the cloud. Definitely, I think increases the adoption and democratization of these uh, these tools. It's uh, it's now possible wherever you are to to get the best best in class tooling uh, at a very uh, affordable price through the cloud and i think this as the regulators uh, you know align globally i mean it's still it's still a bit patchy in terms of the regulatory framework and network around the world but as they start aligning more and more i think you'll start seeing a lot more of this these applications uh, being used uh, on the cloud and uh, i think that's a good thing for all of us thank you mr gupta please yeah yeah adi yeah, thanks for the question I agree with what Amit has been saying. Uh, it's a very exciting time to be in when uh, there's uh, increased use or potential use of AI ML in data governance. One of the bigger challenges uh, from a user perspective is the time to market. You know, the point when you start acquiring data to the point when you are able to create value out of the data. Depending on the complexity of uh, data acquisition or project, it can last anywhere between six months, one year, sometimes even longer. So the advent of new tools to help in for example uh, uh, data labeling you know as as amit mentioned today it takes so much time the large part of 70 80% effort goes into engineering okay so if there are ai ml tools which can do there are ai ml tools available which can do data uh, labeling today but the question is the accuracy okay how what what level of accuracy they can provide at what level an organization is able are comfortable to operate in but as we uh, increase our capabilities we will have more complex ai ml tools available which can do this labeling with higher accuracy which will really crunch down the time to market from acquisition to delivery or to create to creating value similarly the other solutions uh, assessing data quality improving the quality so and so forth which will have the same function one area we am specifically excited about is the cloud okay as amit mentioned uh, you know the regulatory framework is still quite patchy and it's quite dis- uh, distinct if you compare across even in the asian asian region while singapore has been an early adopter but the migration to uh, cloud has been quite patchy has been slow as compared to some of the banks in or some of the other locations like vietnam uh, i was talking to one of the consultant recently uh, uh, from aws and he, he was telling me there's banks in vietnam who are on track to do complete migration of data lake to cloud by 2025 so by that standard singapore is still quite lagging behind i don't think there's any bank which is uh, even thinking about moving all data including pi data to cloud uh, in next 5 to 6 years so that that's something which i'm i'm particularly excited about if there is uh, more uh, uh, the incremental changes in the regulatory framework there's more acceptance uh, to migrating out uh, data to cloud Uh, they're more comfortable with co- data confidentiality on cloud. Uh, this is a space I'm very excited about. Once that happens, the time to market really crashes down. Today, a lot of investments get stuck into data because, as as uh, you know, one of my panelists was mentioning, the value creation is not clear. And one of the reason the value creation is not clear is <laughs> value creation takes so long. So by crunching that or crushing the timeline, uh, the value creation becomes more more and more apparent. You'll see more money flowing into this direction. you indeed uh, mr gupta you spoke about spoke about the accuracy and uh, in velotics in order to improve the accuracy of the data governments or data orchestration we develop our own a uh, tagging system classification system um, and and by the way supporting almost every language in the world and uh, having this functionality enable us to Uh, identify and relate to very specific data item and to provide or, or um, uh, provide the ability to use uh, data uh, with uh, with um, a functionality that we can mask or uh, de-identify a uh, fields data in a row level in a column level and even in a cell level and we provide the users with the ability to access almost any type of data in the organization and because we understand the accuracy based on the tagging system that we have 
uh, people can walk freely in warehouses and lakes, and we will make sure that they will not uh, ex be exposed to specific data, uh, as I said, uh, even in the seller level, which uh, makes us uh, comply with uh, data owners or uh, organization enterprise rules, uh, and, and therefore we keep the data safe and secure, but, but on the other hand, available to anyone inside or outside an organization. Another important point that you made is about the value. And indeed, uh, if we look uh, back several years ago, even a couple of years ago, uh, organizations uh, thought about data from the storage point of view and, no, and not so much from the value point of view. Uh, there, there were a lot of attempts and uh, systems and processes that were built in order just to, to store the data or to make sure it is, it is uh, stored in a way that people can understand where it is and uh, if they need something, they will be easy to locate it. Uh, but nowadays, the trend is not just to locate the data on my, my servers and on the cloud, but also to understand which data can provide which value and how I can, how I can utilize my data in order to provide value uh, to, to the organization. Uh, and this is something that we focus on Velotix, not so much when, when, uh, about the, um, the benefit of the data, but the benefit that drive uh, evolution to or, or, or values to the organization, to the business. Uh, the question that I would like to ask you now is that, uh, how do you see uh, this data government space uh, uh, evolving in the next one or two years? We all know that sometimes we hear uh, uh, buzzwords, uh, keywords, like now, now, for example, data meshing is, is a huge buzzword. And uh, so I would like to ask you, how do you see the, in the next one or two years, the market evolving in terms of data governance? What would be the main focus in this field? What uh, items or, or trends we will see going away, uh, disappearing? And I will hand uh, the question to Mr. Rajan first, please. Sure, thank you. Uh, I think this is, uh... This is a very relevant topic, which is going to just become increasingly more relevant as we go along, right? So that, there's two reasons for it. One is that uh, data, data increasingly the use of data is being recognized by most companies as a key differentiator and almost existential rather than something that's a nice to have. And second is from a customer expectation point of view. So customers are now expecting that, you know, the, the organization they deal with, whether it's a bank or anybody else, understands them, knows about them, and, you know, uh, it, it has to be more personalized service. So data's requirements are just going to go up uh, exponentially as we progress. And therefore, I believe that, you know, the question of data governance then becomes front and center for pretty much every organization. And it doesn't matter which department you are in the organization. I think if it, whether you're talking about the business that is directly talking to the customers, or you're talking about your control functions, your operations, uh, HR, everything is going to revolve around uh, how the companies are able to use their data effectively. And to be able to use it effectively, they need to make sure that it is governed properly. So I think data governance then becomes front and center as well. It goes hand in hand. We've, and you know, my previous panelists have already mentioned the problems of data proliferation and the fact that data propagation across organizations sometimes can be uh, can be you know badly governed or less governed uh, data redundancy etc so all these uh, going back to question there are new tools coming up including yours which is going to help you know get get control of the data much faster i think you're going to start seeing a bit of maturity coming on the governance function because as the roi from data projects start becoming more and more visible then you start you start understanding that you know the investments today everybody's running breakneck speed to implement AI ML, to implement or to make best use of their data. And as you progress, you start seeing that people need to start focusing on cleanup. You know, they're, in, they're uh, gathering some technical debt, which needs to get cleaned up and governance needs to be established around the data. So uh, I think that you want to start seeing a lot more. So, so yes, I think this is, uh, this is a topic which is difficult to sometimes get traction in large organizations or small organizations data stewardship as a culture is not really prevalent yet. And the data ownership by the business 
is again something that most businesses feel is a technology problem it it will change i think over the next 5 to 6 years you're going to see that you know it's going to increasingly come to becoming a topic that the that the exco and the board will have to deal with thank you very much mr singh thank you uh i think i think from uh, from an organization's point of view i think there'll be definitely a lot more investment uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, new products and solutions that can help us in managing uh, you know uh, risk that comes from data governance right uh, which could be across data security across data protection or even the other regulatory challenges uh, the regulations are not going to go away i think the data protection privacy uh, elements will will stay for long will get even more complex as as we sort of become more localized in in our thinking in in many countries so i think this will lead to definitely a lot more trials by the by the organizations in terms of uh, trying out new innovation to manage that data governance risk uh, organizations will fail a bit i guess you know in this journey they they'll fail fast they they learn fast and uh, but i think this demand from the industry will will definitely spur up the innovation and you know disruption in the vendors landscape as well and and you know uh, most likely there'll be more fintech and startups that that jump onto the system uh, i think the other bit i feel is you know within the organization the manpower profiles that you know deal with the uh, the operational handling of data uh, such as the business analysts and you know the the users data users i think they'll become more savvy they'll become more sophisticated uh they'll be more aware of uh, data governance requirements and best practices uh there will be a shift because they will see the value coming out from 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 the organization in terms of business taking more ownership and and that's what i think i think will be a, will be a change uh there there's one more point i would like to highlight you know where i see a bit of uh shift happening in data governance i think there there's a new new space of data ethics which is which is gaining a lot of prominence and i think as uh, as the organizations uh you know uh embed and operationalize a lot of ai and machine learning and data science tools in 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 their business processes uh there's also a growing concern from a you know broad data governance and ethics perspective you know around ethical decision making by the ai models and i feel that you know this is one space where uh organizations and regulators will have to become more uh more smart uh more savvy and and i i would say that you know singapore in a way is already ahead in the game because uh the regulator has been very active and they have release a lot of data ethics principles uh, under feet principles which is you know fairness ethics accountability and transparency but i think for the organizations to adopt it and adopt those policies in a way that uh, you know data ethics risk can be managed and and ai models are robust and ethical in nature i believe that will be the next shift that we see in in uh, you know a new space in in data governance as such thank you and uh, mr gupta Yeah, thanks, Adil. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Rishi, Rishi has just talked about it. I think one big change which I see is coming. It's happening already, but it's getting more and more stronger. Besides all the things which are happening around, is uh, ethical use of data. So how it's not only I would say it's broader perspective. Uh, besides AI, ML models, it's also the actual use of data. How it's being used. So the principles of uh, it's being used fairly. Uh, the use is explainable. It's not surprising for uh, the recipient. It's respectful, which are covered in the feed principle. Are, get, are getting more and more uh, relevance in the way people think about data governance and the way people think about using the data. Today again, it's it's a it's a it's a principle uh, is a uh, is a principle set up by uh, MAS, uh, but. There are also discussions happening whether this will at one point of time uh, transform into a regulation. and if you if you uh, if I follow uh, various uh, commentators on this topic uh, there are already discussions happening on whether this uh, such fairness principles or ethical use or respectful use of data or ai should form into a regulation gradually so this is a space where i feel uh, in next 1 to 2 years uh, we should see more uh, important significance coming to Uh, we didn't coordinate uh, mr gupta the discussion but you always finish with something with exactly the next item <laughs> so uh, i did want to speak a little bit about you, know, you you mentioned ai i will speak about ml um uh, and this this was going to be the next question but i would like to explain how we use a um, machine learning uh, technology or ai technology in velocity so When I say data orchestration, let's take it to the ground a little bit. So 
we have this uh, sophisticated engine that, that monitor the transaction uh, into the data. What does it mean? So people in the organization would like to use the data. Uh, how do I know today if to allow them the access or not? So today everything or mostly uh, the process goes into the data governance and it required manual intervention by the data owner or the, the compliance manager, right, to check the privacy. But in Velotics, we capture this transaction, we learn the transaction and we build what we call the organization policy in terms of using the data. And we uh, learn from each transaction uh, and the approvers or the restrictions the data owners apply, we learn the policy in the organization until we reach a point when the system is almost 80-90% autom automation involved and the rest of the, the processes we still need to learn. But, but the idea is that we're using information from the past, a, a manual information, manual intervention, to learn and apply recommendations about the future. So if we have enough a, a processes of people or machine from inside or outside the organization accessing data and receive the data with a list of restriction. By the way, some of these restrictions are what you mentioned, regulation. Some of the restriction could be enterprise rules and, and so on. So we build the policy in terms of using the data and then we enforce it by either automatically or by recommending the relevant data owner how exactly to address. And with that, you get a, a data system in your organization which is fully secured and managed by Velotix AI. And the next question I would like to address is, is indeed how important you think the role of AI or machine learning, or even blockchain, I may say, uh, will, pay, will play in the data governance uh, space, and perhaps even in, in a disruption way. And I will hand it to Mr. Rajan first. Oops, sorry. Sure. Thank you. So, again, I think, um, in my my opinion, uh, blockchain is not necessarily a disruptor in this space. I think blockchain can be an enabler. Blockchain gives us, through the decentralized, uh, through DLT, it allows us to have an open record of every transaction, and everybody can keep track of every change. That, in my mind, is a big step forward in terms of ensuring transparency and governance. So in fact, you know, even if you look at the current craze of NFTs, at the end of the day, it is just a digital ownership that you're having on, on, the, on the blockchain. So it, it is another application of the same principle. So one by one, as you start seeing, you know, today there is a lot of buzz and for many years, I said, you know, blockchain has been a solution looking for a problem. But as you start, you know, looking at more possible solutions and as you start seeing more, more widespread acceptance, you will start seeing that, you know, whether it's, for example, trade, uh, smart contracts on trade, or you look at asset tokenization. There are many use cases where blockchain can play a critical role, both in terms of generating liquidity and in terms of ensuring transparency. So these are all, you know, what will go towards improving the governance of the data. And the more adoption that happens, the better or easier it is to govern. Uh, but I think... Uh, you, we will face some challenges in terms of either legacy applications, legacy mindsets, as well as uh, as well as just reluctance to change. So that that is something that we'll have to address. But but I think again, I repeat, it's I don't think it's a disruptor. It could become an enabler. We're not there yet, but there is potential for that. Okay, thank you, and Mr. Singh. Thank you. Um... I, I would say I, I completely agree, you know, in terms of the, uh, the blockchain, I don't think it's a disruptor. In fact, it can be an accelerator. Uh, you know, it drives more transparency and better audit trails, which are co co components of data governance. Uh, in terms of AI and machine learning, I, I think they, they would play a big role, right? In big role, and I'll give you an example. Um, we do apply AI machine learning quite, uh, quite often in, uh, in data quality management. And as part of that, you know, in terms of, uh, proactively identifying data quality errors or even trying to rectify certain errors, you know, dealing with large data sets, unstructured data sets. Uh, we do apply a lot of natural language processing. Uh, recently, we had applied this on uh, 
you know, parsing a lot of the industry and sector uh, dimensions that we, you know, typically attach to our corporate customers. And uh, and there's a lot of uh, manual process and, and and judgment applied in terms of what the industry sector should be. So so we we did apply a lot of uh, you know uh, natural language processing techniques and and were able to actually bring down the efficiency or rather sorry raise the efficiency in terms of uh, you know identifying and rectifying uh, data quality challenges with the industry codes. So I do see that there's a, there's a big potential of AI machine learning application in the space of data quality management. Excellent. The uh, next uh, topics, the uh, one before last is about the cloud. So uh, talking a little bit about the cloud, uh, today cloud solution, 80% of organizations are predicted to migrate towards the cloud by 2025, uh, quite a lot. Um, I can tell you that uh, Velotix just uh, announced as a, a Microsoft partner and we're going to place on the marketplace and how do they see, how Microsoft see orchestration uh, or data government solution like Velotix, they definitely see the value uh, of a, a tool that accelerate and uh, promote organization moving to use clouds. Why? Because if, if um, um, you, they use Velotix engine on the cloud, then we ensure that usage of data is safe and secure. How? Exactly in a way that when we enforce the policy, what does it mean to enforce the policy? To ensure that the data is only provided to people or machine that have the right security and, and authorization to see the data. And whatever they cannot see, we mask or anonymize or we prevent them from seeing. We can also uh, encrypt the data and decrypt it only according to the policy. Uh, so they definitely see a uh, Velotix and, and, and similar uh, um, uh, solutions uh, or close to similar because the, our approach uh, solution is, is the first one in the market. They see as a, a solution that enable a, a, or stem or certify, I would say not officially certify right now, cloud solution in terms of protecting data uh, in compliance to the organization rule, but also to the policy, the regulation. And here I would like to ask you, uh, dear panelists, uh, what could be the biggest hurdle in adoption uh, of the innovative solution uh, within data government space? And I'll hand the first question uh, or the first opportunity to Mr. Venkat. Yeah. Um, this is uh, this is something that we are we're all trying to address. Right? So this, um, when it comes to hurdles uh, in data governance, uh, I think it, it will be good to, to understand the life cycle of the data. So I think it's um, uh, if, if there are hurdles and challenges in every part of it, uh, right from, you know, if you look at data governance, first is how do we ensure that our data quality is correct? How do we ensure that there are, we are able to identify the data anomalies and if there are data anomalies, how do we actually able to remediate them as and when they happen? And how do we actually then do it on a continuous basis? Right? So I think it's 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 not a it's not a simple process. You need to that's where the innovation we talked about earlier, usage of AI and ML, usage of uh, trying to automate some of these processes, being able to identify it more accurately. How do we ensure that accuracy of, of our data? So all of that. Is, is very essential. So in order to do that, you need to make sure that you're able to address the key challenges. For me, uh, if you want all your innovation to work, if you want all of this to be automated, if you want to make use of AI and ML techniques, you need to get the buy-in from the, the legal and the compliance. And many of this today, um, in fact, people talk about data democratization. Data democratization is uh, is good to say, but at the same time, you need to understand what is their data democratization. Are you going to give the data to every single individual who gets the data? And what happens when you give the data to somebody? You need to have some level of control, right? Data democratization doesn't mean that you give everything to everybody. So I think we, we need to make sure that we understand what we are trying to address here as a challenge. So legal and compliance. And in fact, I believe in the next six years, data governance will also become 
to a larger extent DIY kind of data governance. It's not going to be a single centralized function that is going to do data governance. It's going to be each individual, each business, each department is actually going to be responsible for their own data governance. And a lot of this, customers will have a say. Today, customers will probably be assuming what customers' privacy want, and to a larger extent, regulations are forcing us to, uh, to speak to customers. But in the, in the future, you need to address that challenge. What is customer? Maybe some customers are willing to share more data. Maybe some customers are willing to actually collaborate and partner with you in sharing the data because they see some value in it. I think this is the point that value creation that um, uh, Rishi Raj was talking about. We need to make sure that we address that challenge. Legal and compliance, value creation challenge, get the customer buy-in and making sure that we all understand that this is a business that we are driving in, keeping data governance as an enabler rather than as a way to protect our assets. I think we need to make sure that we change that mindset. It's a culture, it's a cultural change that we need to make in order to actually go forward in data governance. Thank you so much, Mr. Gupta, please. Thanks, Adil. I think uh, very well said, Bala, when you talked about uh, uh, broadly about Web 3.0, you know, we're not talking about Web 3.0, where the user or the consumer, consumer customer becomes the owner of the data and decides how the data will be used. So data governance plays a very, very pivotal role there. So today, our, while we, there are innovation happening toward Web 3.0, our data governance is still at Web 2.0. We are still coming up curve on there. Uh, when, we, when we talk about innovation in data governance, I, I broadly categorize it into two part, two uh, broad categories. One is on the cloud. I think we already spoke about cloud, so I won't probably touch that part. Second is on the increasing use of AI ML for data governance. Uh, over the last few years, we have seen new tools coming up. You also shared a tool which uh, you have developed for data governance, which ensure data labeling, data accuracy, and so forth. But the way I look at it, data science is still an inexact science. It gives you probability. It will never tell you with assurance, with surety that this is it. So the accuracy level of all these uh, solutions and innovation is still coming up the curve. So that's one thing, you know, till the time the accuracy level becomes higher, it's very difficult to, as, as uh, Bala talked about, it to be sold to uh, the compliance team, the legal team, and all the other uh, stakeholders. So that's something where more innovation is needed. Uh, and uh, the, the higher accuracy is needed before all these innovations can be adopted. Uh, so that's one. Second key challenge I see is a large talent gap. So while Talent gap with the innovators that they don't, they can't find the, uh, enough people to develop such innovation. And also on the client side to adopt those innovation, there's not enough people available with the right skill sets. So these are the two large, besides on the cloud side, on the AI ML side, these are the two large gaps I see, which are, uh, which are not supporting innovation. Thank you so much, Gupta. And the last uh, question, I want to address is about uh, startups uh, like Velotix who present the market um, solution that are data governance related. Um, one of the challenges that I faced during the last uh, year, uh, also during uh, raising capital, now we are a, UC, a US uh, VC back, uh, but also now in approaching clients, is that on one hand, we are a small startups, but on the other hand, operating in the data governance and data orchestration a, a world, um, you cannot focus so much like you want to focus as a small startups because data governance and orchestration involves multiple areas, technological areas. For example, I spoke about how Velotix did using machine learning approach, uh, the organization policy, and I spoke about how we tag the metadata in a sophisticated way in order to enable the level of accuracy. And I spoke about the workflow engine that we have in order to be able to comprise as many workflows as possible to address many organization parts. And, and this is a little bit complicated because when you, as a, you represent a large organization, uh, the panelists, or some of you represent the VCs, and for a small company, you would, you would expect a very high focus 
rather than playing on a large spectrum of functionality. So this trade-off between uh, the focus on, on the spectrum of functionality is a little bit difficult when you operate in the data science orchestration governance world because stand alone focus a, a, a solution cannot really address a, and provide the value for the pain and, to, and the problem that we see in organization a, across the, the world. What would be your opinion about this the approach, perhaps some advice to small startups that build technology around data governance and, and data orchestration? Um, I will leave the question basically open for everybody. Uh, so uh, uh, perhaps uh, Ven Venkat, if you would like to address, and, and later uh, Rajan and, and Singh and Gupta. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you mean uh, from a startup perspective, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. <laughs> This is one area I'm very passionate about also, because I, I, I do see that uh, the lot of startups uh, are coming in and, and trying to address this very important area, right? So everybody is, is trying to, to come up with some very innovative solution. There's a lot of um, use of AI, using ML, using as a policy management engine, very, um, very sophisticated uh, solution. But I think it's it's sometimes it becomes too much technical and advanced solution, which then um, when you when you go and come to when you pitch that kind of solution to enterprise customers to banks or any other customer, it's it's up to the BFSI or the banks to figure out how do we make use of the solution. It's the it's the use cases are simply left to the uh, to the clients and customers to figure out. I think it's it's important that. Uh, to bring in that expertise on identifying those challenges and the areas where the solution actually makes sense. So understanding of the challenges problem and clear use cases when you actually pitch it. And the technical is more like enabling that, making it happen. I think that's how the startups, in my opinion, should, should kind of position this solution. And second, who are you pitching the solution to? Who are you targeting this? Are you going and talking to... Uh, uh, head of data governance, or are you actually reaching out to uh, to the head of business? Um, and if so, are you giving them a correct ROI? So this goes back to the value creation question. Is your solution able to create the value which is urgently needed for that business? So I think if you are able to, to ensure that you address these two points uh, upfront, able to come up with the right use cases, make it as a business challenge, and able to create value creation, I think then uh, I would think that startups are actually addressing it in the right way. Thank you so much. And Mr. Rajan, please next. Sure. I think uh, to build on what Bala said, and I totally agree with, uh, with what he said, it is... Um, and you know, in this, this is again an area of particular interest for me. So I, I work with startups and startup bootcamp here as well as in Singapore and with NUS. So I spend a lot of time with startups and uh, I, you know, I understand what you're saying, Adi, in terms of the fact that data governance and data in general is a large universe. And you know, every every founder wants to make their tool, you know, uh, useful in every part of the problem and solve every problem that you can possibly see, right? But I still think focus is a major uh, major prerequisite from my point of view, and you can prioritize. So, for example, if I'm looking at if I'm looking at buying a data governance tool, I might decide to buy something in a big bang approach and buy everything, or I might decide to go modular. I might say I just want to buy something that will help me with cataloging, something with say lineage, something that will help me uh, with quality, and you know, and then eventually build up to something that is going to take care of MDM for me, or you know, it it doesn't necessarily have to be in one big bang. So in the same way, I think it, one important point to build on what Bala said, because I think those two are critical in terms of ROI and use cases. On top of that, I think to for most startups, it would help if they have a clear focus and are addressing a particular pain area rather than trying to do something for everybody. By no means does that mean they need to stop there, right? So you come to the market with something, you 
uh, and like you said, you've got Deutsch, so you get you get one flagship customer, and then you start building on top of that. I think that's a good approach. Um, again, I think there's there's a lot of money still sloshing around in the market, but that is, I don't think, going to last forever. We're already starting to see some of that uh, taper off. So again, for more for for startups, I think it's important to focus. It's important to try and you know get get those initial customers in the back with by addressing those specific problem areas. And then you can build ahead. Excellent uh, answer, indeed, um, Mr. Singh. Yeah, I think I think one of the uh, challenges I, I guess you know, the organizations face uh, is uh, is about sustainability, right? Uh, it's about uh, you know successfully embracing a solution. So even even if let's say they have actually uh, put it down into operations. You know, operating it successfully over a period of time requires a different uh, set of expertise and discipline and and purpose, and and I think this is where uh, some of that you know the initial ideas of why you brought in that uh, that innovation into the organization or that product into the organization that initial idea sometimes gets lost because of you know uh, people moving out or you know the the priorities changing and so on. So I guess I guess it's important that you know we uh, we instill that element of. Uh, you know, training and change management very strongly in terms of any uh, any innovation that we bring to the organization. And I think I think it's also the the fact that startups tend to have a culture which is quite different from you know traditional traditional organizations, right? So so it's important that we sort of bridge that gap. And uh, you know that that can be done by instilling certain certain training modules. You know, instilling that uh, that that support that comes from uh, applying the growth mindset across the organization hierarchies. Training, training the relevant people in you know, right from the top down to the operating level. Uh, of course, you know it doesn't have to be uh, training uh, uh, at one shot. There could be uh, you know things that can be done at a periodic basis. But I believe this is the non-technical aspect, the more human and the people aspect that will really benefit uh, the startups when they start uh, targeting some of the organizations. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gupta. Please, last no, but not least. Yeah, so uh, I think my panelists have covered uh, most of it. So largely being clear about which specific problem they're trying to solve and focus on that specific problem only. You know, it's, uh, their, their size do not support uh, enough uh, to create a solution for everything. So that's uh, one thing. And the value creation. So I come from the perspective of, uh, so I have represented here from a value from the team which creates value. So from value creation, you know, what are the use cases, how they can help or support to create value? I think these are two uh, couple of things I want, I want to share. Uh, thank you so much. And I have uh, no further questions to the panelists. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I encourage you to uh, look around and see soon our launch into the market, uh, our product. Um, uh, with our uh, uh, first uh, customer, Deutsche Bank, that we built together the system and a few other POC that are already running in the background. Um, excited uh, to be here and thank you so much for the opportunity. And I'm sure that we will uh, meet again. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Adi. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Adi, and thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, thank you. Thank you.